Hey folks, Quill18 here, and welcome to another episode of Let's Play, not Let's Play, but rather a guide to Kerbal Space Program for complete beginners. And we are working on the vessel that will carry us to Minmus, one of the moons of Kerbin. Now, we need to unlock a few more parts for the vessel design that I want to use. So we're going to go into research and development over here. Now, if you watched the last tutorial, you saw that we unlocked fuel systems over here for fuel ducts, going to be very important. We also unlocked unlock general construction to gain access to the uh, strut connector. And also we'll probably use the launch stabilizer because it looks awesome, even though it might not be required quite yet. We're going to lock a couple more things here. We would really like better landing struts. We have access somewhere right over here. We have access to these micro landing struts, but they're going to be a little too small and wimpy um, and, and a little bit wonky to sort of land on. We want bigger landing struts, better landing gear to make it a little bit easier for us to land. So over here in landing, we want to get access to these landing struts. Unfortunately, we can't unlock this directly. We need to unlock either aviation or flight control to be able to unlock landing. They both cost 45. You really can unlock either one because we're not gonna use the parts for either one of these in this particular video. Flight control gives you access to a couple of new like sort of winglets and fins and things like that, which aren't actually important for what we're doing uh, at this time. It also gives you uh, the, it also unlocks a more powerful inline reaction wheel. So reaction wheels we've talked about before, they're normally built into your command modules. They allow you to turn and sort of rotate your ship without using any engines. They're not very good in atmospheric flight. They're mostly used once you're in space. This is a more powerful standalone one that you can add to your ship to get a little bit more. And that could be very handy for some things. We're gonna, we're, and, and in fact, for your landers, you may end up wanna put those on, but I'm gonna leave them off in my particular design. Just again, I'm trying to make do with as less as possible just to show that it can happen. But your life might be easier, in fact, if you unlock this. On the other hand, if you want to do airplane stuff, you'll want to unlock aviation. Now, once we finish our Minmus mission, we'll be sitting on a ton of science. So you're going to be able to unlock all this stuff anyway. Don't worry about it. I'm going to go ahead and unlock aviation because I know I'm going to want to do a airplane tutorial at some point. And uh, we kind of need more airplane parts for that. So I'm going to go ahead and research this. Boop. Excellent. And one more thing I'm going to unlock is down here in electrics. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> and we have to unlock landing. That's that's the real reason for unlocking this. There we go. And then one more part I want to unlock in electrics over here. I would really like to gain access to solar panels. Because in the last mission, when we did our flyby of the moon, we packed some extra batteries to make sure we don't run out of power. A better way to make sure to not run out of power is to just produce your own. And that's what we're going to do with these solar panels. In addition to that, it's going to give us access to a probe core, the probe of benign octo. Now, we actually had access to a probe core earlier um, somewhere. Oh, right here, the probe of benign stay Putnik. But this was not a very useful probe core, which is why we haven't talked about it yet. But we are definitely going to talk about it this time. Also, it unlocks lights. Lights don't do anything. They look cool. So maybe we'll make sure to put them on our spaceship. So we're going to go ahead and unlock that. Doesn't leave me with much science left, but it's okay. Again, if you have the same science as I do, you could also go and unlock flight control, but I'm gonna leave it there. So let's go ahead and leave the facility and start to design our ship over here. So our vessel needs to land on Minmus. I'm gonna call this, oh, I can't name it yet. We're gonna start with a Mark One command pod as per usual. And we are going to assume as per usual that this is more or less the only thing that's gonna be coming home. We could bring more pits home to save a little bit of money, um, but this, this, we have lots of money. It's just taxpayer money. I mean, who cares, right? Tax and spend, that's the Kerbal way, sure. So we're going to go ahead and throw a heat shield under there. Now, what else? Normally, at this point, I put a parachute right on top here, but I want to do something slightly different. Up until now, we have used a pilot Kerbal to pilot our spaceship which makes sense. But one of the things we talked about in our min miss, or our moon flyby is that while you can EVA and pull data out of experiments so that you can use them more than once, you can't do that with the goo canister or the SC9001 material science bay. You can't reset those and use them more than once unless you have a scientist. Scientists uh, first of all, higher experienced scientists can give you more science from a variety of different things, which is kind of cool. Not only that, they can reset goo canisters and material bays so they can be reused. So I would like to, instead of sending a pilot, I'm going to send a scientist. I'm going to send Bob out on this mission. The downside is that Bob does not know how to do stability assist. The SAS that we always turn on that is super critical, 
Only pilots can do that. So Bob will not do that, and really we can't live without SES. We'll never, we'll never get to space without SES. That would be crazy. Our spaceship will go flying all over the place. So what do we do? Well, we turn to computers. Over under pods over here, we now have access to the Probodobodyne Octo. The Sputnik is another probe. These are both things that allow you to fly spaceships without having any astronaut on it whatsoever. The difference is the Probodobodyne Sputnik has no ability to do a SAS whatsoever. It can't do the stability assist. The Probodobodyne Octo, however, by the way, is Probodobodyne the like best word to say? I think it is. The Octo here does have the ability to do SAS. It also has some reaction wheels in here. Of course, we can still use the reaction wheels of the command pod. If we stick this on top, we could literally fly this ship with no Kerbal whatsoever. But we're still going to bring a Kerbal with us because that way Bob can reset our science experiments. So we're going to do that, and then I'm going to stick a parachute on top. The probe core is not that heavy, 0.1 tons. Um, I'm very confident that a that this parachute here would still be able to bring us to a nice and comfortable stop without any real problems whatsoever. So this is the thing that we're going to be coming home with, plus probably a couple of experiments. So let's go ahead, as per usual, we're going to go and stick a couple of science experiments, and apparently, if we stick them on the back here, we can still reach them very conveniently from the front door, so that sounds lovely. So we're going to put the press mat barometer and the thermometer so we can do experiments on Minmus. We'll also be doing experiments in space high above Minmus. We'll be doing experiments in space near Minmus. And then finally, once landed as well. Last thing I want to add to the top here are the solar panels. Under electrical over here, we're going to add solar panels. Now, your uh, command module, if we right click on it, can hold 50 electric charge. Your probe core can hold another 10. You may, depending on you know what you're looking for, you may want to add more batteries. Either one of the side packs, these can hold 100, or one of these inline stack ones, which can hold 200. It's up to you. I think we're going to do fine without any extra batteries, um, but maybe it would be safer. You know what? It definitely would be safer if we went and stuck another battery bank on here. Because if we end up spending a lot of time, say, on the dark side of, of Minmus or eclipsed from the sun or something like that, we might find ourselves depleting our battery charge a little bit more. Normally, your batteries only run while you're, say, activating your reaction wheels, but the probe core will constantly be draining power as well. Not much, but some. But more importantly is we're going to throw some solar panels on here. I'm going to go into symmetry mode. I'm going to put a pair of, sol oops, pair of solar panels here. I like them on an angle because obviously they can catch sun from the side, but they can also catch them from above. It's not going to be quite as effective if it's an angle like this, but we really don't need the solar panels to do much. We, we have very little power requirements. We just need some. I'm going to go and throw another pair on the front and back over here. So we basically have every angle covered. Right from the bottom, we wouldn't be able to get sun, but I, know, I think that's going to be fine. So this is everything we're bringing home, and I'm pretty sure this parachute will be able to cope that. If I were worried that it wouldn't be sufficient to stop this probe, or this... Um, uh, this capsule, I could use a couple of radial parachutes. If you wanted to do a test, here's what you could do. You could put a decoupler under here. Hell, I'm, I'm almost tempted to do it. You know what? Safety first. I mean, I know that's not the Kerbal way, but let's verify that this parachute will be enough. Because I actually haven't tested this design. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to throw a little flea down here. I'm actually only going to put in, by right click on the flea, I'm only going to have it like a third full of fuel or something like that. I don't want to go very high. I'm going to check the staging. Uh, we've got the rocket first, then the decoupler, then the parachute, and I'm actually going to have no crew. I'm just going to have the probe fly itself. We're going to confirm that this ship can be flown with just the probe by itself. And we're just going to go up and then make sure that the parachute works coming back down. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and call this the Minmus Lander Mark 1 over here. Save that. Uh, yeah, over right. Apparently I was using that name in my test here. My test video. Do, 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 do. So all we're going to do is we're going to fire straight up. So SAS on. We have access to SAS because the probe core is smart enough to do it. It can't hold prograde or retrograde or anything like that. More advanced pro co probe cores will have that ability. This one can only do the normal stability assist. Throttle doesn't matter because it's a solid rocket booster. We're going to hit space to launch. It's going to run out of fuel pretty quick, which is what I want. I don't want to go too high. It's going to keep carrying us up a little bit from with momentum. I'm just going to wait for... I guess I could decouple now, and we'll go ahead and pop out the parachute. We're still going up right now, but that's okay. I'll turn off SAS because it's not really important. I'm impatient, so I'm going to do a little physics warp here to times four. Okay, let's stop the time warp. Parachute will fully deploy here, 
And we're just going to verify that we're not going to land too fast. And what's too fast? I think this Mark 1 command pod can handle an impact of 12 meters a second. We could check on that in the VAB. Clearly, it's going to slow us down to about 6, which is fine. All right, you know what? That's great. We're just going to revert back to the vehicle assembly, having confirmed that this would work perfectly okay. So I'm going to remove the SRB here. And yet, if you go and you mouse over, you can see tolerance. Oh, it can actually handle a 14 meter per second impact. This command pod quite sturdy, so that's lovely. Okay, so confirm, we've got a heat shield underneath there, great. Well, we're gonna put a decoupler. And then what? Well, and then the next thing we have to do is build the stage that's gonna be landing on Minmus. This stage is gonna be responsible for landing on Minmus and in fact, leaving Minmus as well. It's gonna serve double duty. In the, um, the Apollo landing style, there was one stage for the landing, and then it was time to take off from the moon. They they did another stage there with the decoupler. It would be a little awkward for us to duplicate that with the parts we have access to, um, and it's really not necessary on Minmus. It's not even really necessary on the moon and Kerbal here. We're going to be A-OK. -okay. So we're going to design the stage that's meant to land. We're also going to include some more experiments, because we've only got these two on the back. I want the other two science experiments we have access to, which is the Science Junior and the Mystery Goo. We have not yet talked about this experiment storage unit. It's just a more convenient way to grab all the data out of all of your experiments and store them in one location. I'm gonna leave this off for now. We'll probably talk about it more properly later on. So let's say I put a Science Junior under here. Uh, let's hold off on the mystery goo for just a second. So how are we gonna land? Well, Minmus has no air, has no atmosphere. So we can't use a parachute, which means we have to do a powered landing. We have to have a jet engine underneath us, or not a jet engine, but a rocket engine underneath us, that when we start descending towards Minmus, before we hit the ground, we're gonna burn this rocket engine so that we cancel our downward velocity and try to get to as close as zero velocity before we touch the ground, so that we touch the ground with a nice, soft, gentle landing. Now, what we could do is we could put a fuel tank under here, and then we could grab an engine. Um, we're gonna talk about what engine we're going to use, but it's going to be the Terrier, but I'm gonna talk about why that's gonna be in a second. But we could do that, and we could throw some landing gear. The problem is, with something like this, well, it will, it will definitely work. This will definitely work. The problem is, this is quite tall. And that means it's very susceptible to probably just falling over. Does this look very balanced and steady to you? Not really. You know what would look a lot more balanced and a lot more sturdy? If we grab this and went into symmetry mode, and let's say we stuck you on here. This is shorter and wider. This should be a lot more balanced. I mean, just intuitively, it feels about right. What you're or effectively doing here is we're lowering our center of gravity. The, the lower the center of gravity, the more stable our shape will be. Not only that, but by having a wider base here, we can have a sort of a wider footprint with our landing gear and gain even more sturdiness. So let's go and put some landing gear. So underground over here, we're gonna be using these LT1 landing struts. So the micro ones would work, but they're a little small. The landing struts will be a lot bigger. If we grab that, and we're still in dual symmetry mode. If I go and say, stick them here, you can see it does the same thing on the other side. So I'm just gonna alt click on one of these and stick them over here like that. See, it's got a nice wide base very unlikely to tip over. It feels very, very secure uh, to me, which I like quite a bit. We could uh, we could even flare these out a bit. If I just went and like sort of moved them one notch, oops, that's probably too high. We'll check, um, and then just one notch over that way. That's with the uh, the C key for toggle snap here. Where the snap is on, so we get sort of one snap off the side. So it's a little bit flared out. Not much, but just a little bit, and I think that's gonna be even more happy. How are we for height? They don't have to be exactly the same. Um, but the ones on the right here are a little bit lower, so I think something more like that. Looks pretty good over here. Excellent. So let's assume we're going to land with this. Now, let's, let's talk about fuel and let's talk about engines. This stage, first, like, let, let's, we're working our way backwards, right? It's always the way I design my ship. We start with the end phase, then we go to the next one. Will this one, let's assume we're sitting on the surface of a Minmus right now. Will this be able to lift us off the surface of Minmus? Well, we know the way to figure that out is to look at thrust versus weight. Now, this tooltip over here tells you the mass of your ship. And the weight, the amount gravity is pulling down on you, is not the same as mass. Now, on 
Earth, in real life, the, um, the units that we use happen to be interchangeable. If something has one kilogram of mass, then on the surface of the Earth, it has one kilogram of weight, but they're not actually the same thing. That's one of the reasons when I talk about weight of the ship, I've been very explicit as much as possible to always say the thing, again, 9.8 meters per second squared, that's the force of gravity, we, we, we round that off to 10, so the entire mass of the ship times 10, that's how much gravity is pulling down on us. And that pull down, that's the real weight of the ship. So on Kerbin here, the weight of the ship would be a downward force of about 50 kilonewtons. That is not the case on Minmus. Think about it. We know in real life, the moon has a gravity that's about one sixth the gravity of Earth in real life. And the same is true in Kerbin. Uh, in Kerbal Space Program. The moon has about a sixth the gravity of Kerbin itself. Minmus is even tinier and has even less gravity. I actually don't know how much it is, but it's a lot less. So our, the force of that is gonna be microscopic. It's probably like, probably the force of gravity is gonna be under five kilonewtons. So we're not even multiplying by 10. We're probably multiplying by a number smaller than one when it comes to Minmus. Very, very, very little. Which means that these engines here, these terror engines, actually have a thrust of 60 in a vacuum. Only about 15 at sea level. That's in an atmosphere. But we're not going to be in an atmosphere. We're on Minmus. There's no air. It's going to be in a vacuum. Each one of these has a thrust of 60. They're going to be ridiculous amounts of overkill. We'll definitely be able to take off. In fact, we might be forced to derate them a little bit for the landing, but that's a whole nother thing. So that's great. How about in terms of fuel? Is this going to be enough fuel to take off? No, note, we could save fuel. We could go with just one engine. Think about it. If we're saying that one engine is going to be more than enough to take us off, then why would we even have two? Because two just adds an extra, they're a half ton each. It's an extra half ton of weight we don't actually need. And in fact, this would be a much, much better lander for us. But what I'm going to do is I'm still going to go on the side because two reasons. One, it looks really cool. And two, we're going to use a really funky trick um, for the next stage of our ship that's going to look really, really awesome. So is this going to be enough fuel to take us off from Minmus and bring us home to Kerbal? Um, we don't know. My, yes, the answer is yes, but we don't actually know. And unfortunately, we're sort of going to have to cross our fingers and hope. But it will be enough. I'm going to tell you now. In fact, this stage is also going to be used to land on Minmus. And as it turns out, a funny, funny fact of physics is if we're in orbit around Minmus, the amount of fuel we need to break orbit and land is actually exactly the same as the amount of fuel we need to lift off from the surface of Minmus and re-enter orbit. With the caveat that we're not going to be landing as efficiently as we're going to take off. But that is actually true, which is kind of nifty. Most likely, this is going to be enough to get us to land on Minmus, take off from Minmus, and bring us home, because Minmus is very light. I'm going to go, because we're going to be taking off with this, and these things are flat and therefore not aerodynamic, I'm going to throw a couple of nose cones on there. These nose cones, again, have a little bit of weight, but it's very little, and overall will save fuel by not fighting the air as much on the way up. So we're going to do that. And what I'm going to do before we move on, I'm going to add our very last science experiment, the mystery goo. Um, I don't want it to be symmetrical. I just want the one because we can reset it with Bob. And I'm going to put it like here. I mean, no matter where we put it, one mystery goo container is not going to be balanced. But if we put it here, Bob can sort of reach it very conveniently. It's going to be fine. We're going to do that. I suppose what I could also do, actually, is put it here. By the way, you can rotate parts using W... A, S, D, and Q, and E. Um, I never remember like what the right rotation for what I want is, so I end up mostly mashing all the buttons until the right thing happens. I'm going to put it here. Because it actually might act like a little bit of a step. It might make our life a little bit easier later on. It'll either make it much easier or much, much harder. I don't know which yet, but we'll find out what it is. So we got all our science experiments. Great. Do a little save here. Let's build the next stage. So if this is the stage that's going to be responsible for landing landing on Minmus and taking off from Minmus and taking us home, the next stage we built is going to be the, the stage that's mostly going to be responsible for bringing us from Kerbin, like from orbit around Kerbin, to, to Minmus. Now, before we move on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click on these landing gears and tell them to start retracted. Same thing over here. Start retracted. By the way, these auto strut and rigid attachment options you probably don't have. That's an option you can enable in the menu. If I save, I should, I'm just going to turn it off right now because I don't want to confuse your life. But if you're wondering why I have a couple of options that you don't, if you go here and you hit escape, 
and you go to settings, there's an option, I think down at the bottom, called advanced tweakables. I turn that on for some things that I do, you know, with more advanced and fancy and complicated ships. I'm going to go and disable that again, because we don't need that right now. We'll talk about it later on, but for now I'm going to turn that off because I don't want to pollute your view and confuse you. There you go. So now this should look like you. You should start shielded, or deploy shielded, and start extended. Good. Excellent. So let's build the next stage. We're going to need a decoupler. And what we're going to do is we're going to throw some sort of fuel tank on this. Okay? I think we're going to be kind of okay with kind of this mid-range fuel tank. We don't. I don't think we need the weight of a full T-800. Just, again, at this point, it's mostly sort of semi-instinct, what I feel. Doesn't mean it's necessarily true. Now, what we could do is we could go and throw an engine underneath here. Right, and say, ah, this is the engine that once we're in space around Kerbin, it's going to push us away from Kerbin and send us to Midmiss. But at this point, I'm going to say, we really don't need an engine here. We've got two perfectly good engines over here. Why can't we just use them? Now, what we don't want to do is use fuel out of any of these two fuel tanks. We want to save this for our landing and takeoff. But we could use this fuel tank to power these two engines using the fuel duct that we, we learned about last episode. If I click on this, and let's say I put a fuel line that goes like that, and another, it's important I click on this middle tank first, because this is where it's going to flow from, and to there. What this means is these two engines will actually get fueled by this fuel tank, and I don't even need the weight of an extra engine over here. Completely unnecessary. We don't care. When we're in space, we don't care about thrust. It do, we don't care how long it takes us to burn. All we care about is that we are using our fuel efficiently. And so we could throw a third engine on here, but what's the point? It's just extra weight that isn't going to get us to go any further. It'll accelerate us more quickly, but it won't actually get us any further. In fact, the weight will just mean we go less far. So let's go with something like that. I know that the, uh, the lines aren't exactly equal, but it's fine. So this is going to be the stage that is hopefully going to bring us from Court Kerbin's orbit to Minmus, and maybe help us br go into Minmus's orbit. So we're going to go ahead and put another decoupler underneath this. And now we're going to build our ascent stage, the thing that's responsible for getting us into space. And this is the one area where thrust is critical because we need enough, th enough thrust to cancel the force of gravity over here on Kerbin. So I'm going to use, I'll use these T-800 tanks because I need fewer parts to do that. If we put a couple on here, how's our weight looking? 16.6 .6 tons, which means at this point, if I throw on an engine, the swivel engine weighs 1.5 tons, 18.1 tons. And we know the swivel engine can only lift something at a max of maybe, well, for hover, about 17 tons. And in fact, it really wants whatever it's lifting to be no more than 14 or 15 tons to be able to take off from Kerbin because of Kerbin's gravity. This will not move us at all on the launch pad. So what do we do? Well, this is where we're going to use more engines like before. Well, there's two possibilities. We could lighten this. I mean, I could absolutely do that, right? I could go and say... Let's put it just a swivel here. Okay, now we're at 13.64 tons. This would be sufficient to lift us off the launch pad, but there's not a whole lot, heck of a lot of fuel in there. Not really feeling it. Let's go and try to bring, we're gonna bring the weight up. Let's put a T400 over here and put that. What are we looking at? Okay, closing on a 16 tons, which means this will move us up. Not very quickly, but it will move us up. That's not a very efficient thrust to weight ratio for initial takeoff. But once we're quite high up in the air, that's going to be fine to continue getting us to space. We're going to be okay with that. But we clearly need more go juice. One, this is not enough fuel in general to get us to orbit. Not with all this weight up top. Not enough fuel. Plus, this thrust wouldn't be great at the launch pad. So let's go and do what we did last time and do some asparagus staging. We're going to go to coupling. We're going to take this radial decoupler. I'm going to go into symmetry mode over here. I'm going to go on the side here. Again, we're going to try to go as high up as possible because you want your decouplers to be quite high. Um, and I'm going to take one of these T-800 fuel tanks and stick it over here. We need just enough space left over that we can... I'm just going to alt-click on this um, uh, nose cone so that they don't whack each other. That looks... Okay, I might be a little bit more comfortable if we were just a scooch lower. Just don't want these things to bang on each other on the way up. There we go. That should be okay. So let's say I alt-click on this, and... Oh, I don't want the nose cone. Never mind. So let's just grab a T-800, put it here. I'm going to alt-click on the swivel engine to copy it, and put it down there. So now we've got three of these engines. If they all burn at the same time, which we can happily do with the external fuel duct, 
Again, if you don't know what I'm doing with these ducks, watch the last video. It's very, very, very powerful, very important. We've got a weight of currently of 37 tons. So, and or more importantly, so that's about 370 kilonewtons of gravity pulling down. We've got three engines. Each one has 170 kilonewtons of force pushing upwards. It's 170 times three is 510. So this setup can comfortably lift up to about 51 tons of weight um, and still go up efficiently. So in fact, that's so much extra that I think I'm gonna feel comfortable. Let's see what happens if we add in a wee bit more over here. There we go, we're at 41 tons. And again, this setup can lift about 51 tons very comfortably and quite quickly. I like that. Now, this may, these, all this put together and sort of, um, well, it's not, at this point, I wouldn't quite call it asparagus yet because it's, you know, not as much to look like in a bunch of asparagus. This may be enough to get us into orbit, but I don't like maybe enough. One of the lessons you learn early on in Kerbal is there's no such thing as too much overkill. So let's go ahead and do this again and do go into proper asparagusing. So I'm gonna grab you. I will once again grab a couple of T800 fuel tanks. We're gonna put you there. It's very important, by the way, that when you're putting this down that you actually mouse over the decoupler and have the decoupler turn green, which you can sort of barely see over there because if you put it down here, what you're gonna do is you're attaching it to the other fuel tank. The decoupler is not gonna work. It's, it's quite easy to miss. Like if I do this, this decoupler is not actually attached to this fuel tank. The this fuel tank is just welded directly onto the main body is no good. So you gotta make sure that the mouse over goes above the actual decoupler and alt click to copy. I'm gonna alt click to copy the nose cone, put it on there. And then we're gonna do what we talked about in the last episode. These three engines are gonna provide more than enough steering for what we need. As a result, uh, what I'm gonna do, instead of putting on another swivel engine, I'm gonna use the Reliant. The Reliant does not have gimbling, doesn't have thrust, thrust vectoring, doesn't swivel. So you can't steer with the Reliant. But these other three will give us more than enough steering. And in exchange, the Reliant has more thrust, it's also more fuel efficient. Engine ISP, this is the specific impulse, this is your fuel efficiency. Bigger number equals more fuel efficiency. The Reliant has a few, an efficiency of 265, whereas the Swivel has 250 at sea level. So the Reliant is more fuel efficient and happens to be stronger as well. So we're gonna put a pair of those on the outside, and then we're gonna make sure for the asparagusing to grab the fuel ducts, and it's gonna go from this outside one to this outside one over here. We're gonna make sure for our staging that all five engines light at the same time, because we don't wanna carry any dead weight. We want all the engines to be active. Then we're gonna stage and remove this outermost one, right? This is our outermost asparagus over here. So it has to stage first. Then the next set of boosters will stage. At that point, we will go ahead and separate the ascent stage over here. It's not gonna reveal another engine, right? After we do that. So it's important that after we drop the ascent stage, the next engines that light are actually gonna be these two. So we drop the ascent stage, we light these two engines, at some point this fuel tank runs out, so we dump it, and then we're left with just the, the, the setup that we're gonna be landing on Minmus with. Then at some point, we're gonna discard all of that and parachute in. I think this will work. Um, I guess we'll put some fins on this. Now, at this point, fins here, is this low enough to like sort of work and do what we want? It's probably okay. Fins that are too high up tend to cause you to flip out. I could and maybe should just put fins right at the bottom of the second set of boosters because most likely by the time we get to this middle stage, we're gonna be so high up in the atmosphere that we're not gonna need fins anymore. I'm really tempted to do that. You know what, what the heck? So I'm still on dual symmetry. One of the things is I can't, if I go to another type of symmetry like time six, as soon as I mouse over something with twin symmetry, it just switches back to twin. So I'm gonna put it say here, alt click and here. So they're flared out a bit and then there's gonna be another pair on the other side. I think that's gonna give us the, the stability we want. Oh, speaking of stability, Right now, all these side boosters are only attached at the top, so they're gonna wobble like mad. So we're gonna go to structural, we're gonna grab some strut connectors, and we're gonna make sure that the side boosters are connected in some manner to the middle component. So now all of them should be bound to the middle in some way. We could link them to each other, but that's not gonna make any real difference or help us out at all. Let's give this a try. Let's see if we can get this to orbit, and if so, then we'll stop there and in the next episode, we're going to be talking about tracking stations 
and maneuver nodes. We're going to get to orbit one more time without maneuver nodes. So let's give it a go. Um, I don't think I've got a Kerbal in the driver's seat. Because we did the test where we had no Kerbal. Yeah, I have no Kerbal. So this thing, um, until it got out of antenna range, would be able to fly itself. But that's not going to be very helpful. Hold on. Uh, I'll just uh, revert to VAB to save myself a couple of clicks here. A couple of things. We are going to go and shtick Bob Kerman, the scientist, back in the command pod. Also, under structural here, I'm going to go and put the launch stabilizers. Because they look cool. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be in symmetry mode again. Get a pair of launch stabilizers. They're going to hold the ship off the ground. Stop it from like sort of having to rest on its boosters. Which again, isn't critical right now. Becomes incredibly important later on. And in any case, it stops a little bit of wobble. And make sure we face straight up. I'm going to make sure that these decouple at the same time the engines light. In real life, you'd want to light the engines first and then decouple. In Kerbal, you're going to be fine. So we'll go ahead and launch again. So Bob's in the quote unquote driver's seat. And he is going to be responsible for driving, especially when we get outside of antenna range from the uh, the space center over here. And the probe, the probe can only work with a direct connection over here. We'll be looking at radio connections later on. But I believe even when we're out of radio range, I think the probe will still enable SAS. So Bob, because he's not a pilot, would normally not be able to toggle on SAS, but we can because the probe provides that. We're going to go to full throttle, and we're going to hit spacebar. Three, two, one, go, and we have liftoff. Five engines are all burning, including two Reliant engines, which we haven't used before. As per usual, when we get to about 100 meters per second, I'm going to start turning towards the east over here uh, and initiate this gravity turn. Everything's looking A-OK. -okay. We do will have a lot more air resistance than before here, um, and it's going to be very, very important, even more than before, that we don't get out of the yellow prograde circle. Because if you're outside of the yellow prograde circle, there's a much higher chance that the wind will catch your ship in an awkward way and cause you to flip out, especially if there's more space for the air to catch you, as is this case over here. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to keep adjusting up and down a little bit to try to stay on the 90 degree mark. Um, Again, going east means we get to take off with a bit of a boost because the, the, the planet is rotating in that direction. Uh, going to Minmus, there is an optimization. Hold on a sec, we're about to run out of fuel on two of our things, so we're going to dump them behind. Excellent. There is an optimization with your takeoff that may imply that leaving not completely equatorial is more efficient. And actually, it is if you can plan it exactly right, but that's quite hard to do. So just leave e equatorially and everything's going to be okay. You'll see what I mean when we deal with uh, in the next episode. So uh, we are going a little bit more vertical, so I'm not hitting the 45 degree mark here. So we're going to be taking off a little bit more steeply than before, and that's okay. One of the things with the steep ascent is um, while it is slightly less fuel efficient, it's a lot easier and actually a lot safer because of different things with thrust and aerodynamics and different things like that. You could end up uh, finding yourself in a slight bit of trouble actually taking off too flat with a kind of a complicated and heavy and non-aerodynamic ship. So what I'm going to do here, just, just for style points, is I'm going to go ahead and rotate my ship. I really like to drop side boosters off sideways. I don't like when I disconnect from something that's above me because I'm always worried gravity is just going to pull it into me. So we're going to do that. Keep in mind that's going to change all my controls over here. Uh, I'm going to point here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit M at this point to check out the map. Extend the nav ball so I can still steer. And a wrap waps us above 70. Uh, again, anything above 70 means you get to space. I'm going to let it go to, I don't know, here. Um, if, and we don't have that unlocked yet, if you get to the point where you start using maneuver nodes to circularize, which has tons of advantages, you may want to raise your apoapsis a little higher because it'll give you more time between leaving the atmosphere and hitting apoapsis to plan your maneuver. Here, we should be okay. Also, if you have a ship that's going to have less thrust to weight ratio um, when you're trying to perform this, i.e. you're going to have to burn for a long time to circularize, then again, you'll want to push the apoapsis up a little bit higher to give you more time to work out the... Um, the circularization. And in fact, you know what? This is a heavier ship. This is a heavier ship. Our circularization burn might be a little longer than I'm than we're used to. Therefore, I will go ahead and burn higher. Again, any fuel you spend getting your apoapsis higher is sort of a waste. Although, in this case, since we're going all the way to min-miss, it's less of an issue and it gives us a lot more of a safety margin. So again, I'm just going to turn prograde. I'm going to burn here. Um, actually, what I'll do is I'll burn towards the horizon. Because the more I burn towards the horizon, the flatter 
the curve will be, which is ultimately what you're going for for circularization. Since I'm burning early, I'm pushing the apoapsis ap ap away from me and higher, but again, that will give us more time to actually work out the circularization. So I'm just going to keep burning. Oh, I think we just ran out of fuel in this stage. Actually, we may have done that a while ago, which means I may have been hauling extra weight. Uh, not too much, because this was mostly 100%. Okay, we're all right. Uh, the one downside is you can't see your fuel on this screen. You can if you click on the uh, resource icon over here and click whoops, stage view. It'll only show you the amounts in the current stage, so you can use that to see if you're about to run out. So apoapsis 95. Again, I'm going to point basically right at the horizon and burn that way. Push it, push it, push it to 100, which is a nice round number. Feels good. There we go. So again, this is higher than we strictly need to be to reach orbit, but if our burns for circularization are going to be longer, we're going to need the extra time over here. And already we've been able to push our, our route relatively flat here. So even though the, the start of our ascent was relatively steep, we were able to flatten things out quite a bit with this. So I'm going to quick save because I'm going to time warp. Again, if you have maneuver... Should we talk about maneuver nerds? we got time. Now I really want to save it for the next episode because we're already 35 minutes in. So let me go and... Unless I just save here. Now that's an idea. Normally what we would do is we'd coast to Apoapsis, or we'd get close to it, we'd start our burn. If the burn was pushing the Apoapsis away, that would be a hint that we'd started too soon. So we'd either throttle down, or just kill the throttle completely and try again later, or what you can do is you can throttle down to the point where the distance between you and the Apoapsis stays kind of consistent, and you can keep doing that until the Apoapsis and Periapsis finally flip completely, which means you're in a circular orbit. We're going to stop here, and in the next episode, we're going to see how we can plan that maneuver to hopefully gain a little bit more efficiency. Thank you very much for watching, folks, and I'll see you guys next time.